19 and reading the whole chapter. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, the words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth for his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold. They are, <clears throat> they are than much pure God, gold. They are honey. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is God's word. It is nice to see some of you a little bit closer now that my eyesight is beginning to fade a bit as I get older. Um, You know, when you get so few people, I know I've said this many, many times, so it really is um, almost a bit redundant. Sometimes you can wonder, I hope the rapture hasn't taken place um, and we've been left behind. But seeing Grant here, we must know we're okay. Okay, why don't we ask the Lord to help us to understand this is a great psalm and uh, that God would open up our eyes to see uh, the wonderful truths within it. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful for your word. It is a living word. And as you continue to reveal it to us today, It has the same relevance that it had when it was first given to your people thousands of years ago. We thank you that it is an enduring word. It will last forever. And we are grateful that we can meet like this together and we can hear your word preached freely amongst us this evening. We think of those around the world who are under severe persecution And ask, Lord, that as they meet together, you would protect them, watch over them, keep them safe as they sit under your word. We ask for ourselves this evening that you would give us insight into not only what your word is saying, but how it ought to govern our lives, the way in which we need to make adjustments in order to live consistently with it. Speak to us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. One of the things in life that I've really enjoyed over the years is reading biographies and autobiographies. And when you sit down with one of those books and you begin reading about the life of someone, it gives you insight into that person. It tells you a bit about them. They share, depending on what level they go, but they often will share some things you wouldn't learn about them had you not read the book. And I find that after I've read a biography or an autobiography, as though I know the person, even though I've never met them, I know them because they've shared something about themselves to me. The heavens is God's autobiography at one level. 
Now, it's not the only biography that God has given us because the word is the more specific way in which God has revealed himself. But the psalmist begins by referring us to the universe, referring us to the heavens, and saying to us, if you cannot see God's handwriting in the heavens, there's something wrong with you. It should be obvious to all. And if that is not obvious enough, God has revealed himself in his word so that when you pick up that word and you begin to read that word, what should happen to you is you should have a living encounter with God. Because this word primarily is about God, self-disclosure of who he is and all that he has done. And God has given us his word, not so that we would just read it and, and feel some warm, fuzzy feelings, though you may feel that when you read it, or perhaps at other terms feel a little bit convicted because of the way in which it shines its light into the depths of our soul. But his word ought to enable us to have an encounter with him. It should never be a kind of an arm's length thing that we do where we read it and we're kind of distant from it. But rather, it should affect us in all of our lives, the way we live, the way we think, the way we speak, the attitudes we have, the way we conduct our lives. God's Word should enable us to live in a way that reflects our understanding of who He is, and that should modify all of life. So firstly, I want you to notice the revelation of God in the skies, verses 1 to 6. The revelation of God in the skies. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth their speech. And so the psalmist begins to direct our attention on the fact that wherever you go in the universe, the one thing you cannot escape from is God's handiwork. And all you have to do is cast your eyes to the heavens, and there you see something of the nature of God. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about what it can and what it can't do. But what revelation of the skies does do is it points to the fact that there is a God. When you see the design of the universe, it's telling us that what stands behind that design is a designer. And that is what we call in theology is general revelation. Now, general revelation is not revelation that can ultimately lead you to Christ. What general revelation does is it gives you an understanding that there is a God. Now, general revelation may not tell you exactly what that God is like. Because if you are a bushman and you're looking at a lion kill a, um, a buck, then you might think that's a pretty cruel God that lives in heaven, that creates creatures that kill each other. But what revelation does at least do is it begins to clue you in that there is something bigger than what we are and who we are. And it reminds us that it points us to God who is the creator of the universe. Now, I know that evolution has been popularized today. I know it's taught in school. And I know that it is the, the main view of many out there who don't believe in God, that somehow we evolved. Believing in evolution is like believing that a whirlwind can go through a auto wrecker yard, a wrecker yard, and once it's been through that yard, at the end of it is a brand new Porsche. And, and there's a sense in which it's almost crazy, because by a sheer logic, I think one can understand that evolution really just has so many flaws, it makes it so implausible that in order for you to believe in evolution, which uh, revol evolution means you need millions of years and you have massive jumps that need to be made, and yet you have no proof that any of those jumps have been made. And when you think about something coming from nothing, that I think it is uh, Richard Dawkins has written a whole book on something coming from nothing. In and of itself, that is just bizarre. The obvious cause of all of this must be someone who has designed it. There must be a creator that stands behind it. And that witness extends wherever creation is seen, leaving everyone 
without an excuse. So that Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 1, verses 18 to 21, and this is what Paul says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and the wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Hear evolution. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For though they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Is that not a wonderfully apt description of the world in which we live today? The truth is there, it's obvious, it's proclaimed throughout the world, and yet humanity has suppressed the truth, and they've come up with alternative theories to try and dismiss that truth and to say it's irrelevant, and their minds have been darkened and they've become foolish in their thinking. And that's God's assessment of humanity when it denies what is obvious to all. Charles Spurgeon put it like this. Every moment, God's existence, power, wisdom, and goodness are being sounded abroad by the heavenly heralds which shine upon us from above. He who would guess at divine sublimity should gaze upward into the starry vault. He who would imagine infinity must peer into the boundless expanse. He who desires to see divine wisdom should consider the balancing of the orbs. He who would know divine fidelity must mark the regularity of the planetary motions, and he who would attain some conceptions of divine power, greatness, and majesty must estimate the forces of attraction, the magnitude of the fixed stars, and the brightness of the whole celestial train. It is not merely glory that the heavens declare, and this is so important, but the glory of God. For they delivered to us such unanswerable arguments for a conscious, intelligent planning, controlling, and presiding creator that no unprejudiced person can remain unconvinced by them. The testimony given by the heavens is no mere hint, but a plain, unmistakable declaration. And it is a declaration of the most constant and abiding kind. Yet for all this, to what avail is the loudest declaration to a deaf man or the clearest showing to one spiritually blind? God, the Holy Ghost, must illuminate us or all the sons in the Milky Way never will. And I think that puts it so aptly, doesn't it? Notice what else he goes on to say. Day after day they pour forth their speech, night after night they display their knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In other words, God doesn't have to say anything for God to be known in some sense through the creation which speaks, even though it doesn't speak in an audible sense. It makes clear who God is. Since the sky is extensive throughout the world, there's no place where God cannot be discovered. So even in the remotest parts of the world, there is a sense in which a person can come to know that there is a God. Now, special revelation is the revelation, which we're going to see a little later on, where God reveals himself through his word and through the incarnation of his word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how we come to Christ through special revelation, which we're going to come to that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Napoleon, that great French general, 
One evening, when he was returning to France after an expedition to Egypt, a group of French officers entered into a discussion concerning the existence of God. I bet you didn't know this about Napoleon. They were on the deck of the vessel that bore them over the Mediterranean Sea. Thoroughly imbued with the skeptical and aesthetical spirit of the times, they were unanimous in their denial of God. It was decided to ask the opinion of Napoleon, who was standing alone wrapped in silent thought. On hearing the question, is there a God, he raised his hand, pointed to the starry firmament, and simply responded, gentlemen, who made all that? It's almost an apt answer, isn't it? It's almost in a sense in which you're saying to the unbeliever, it's obvious, isn't it? You have to be dumb and, die, and, and, and blind not to see that this creation has been brought into existence through a greater intelligent creator. Notice what else he says. Their voice goes out to all the earth. They were in the heavens. He has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like the bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run in his course. So he talks about the sun in terms of its splendor. The bridegroom shows its splendor. The champion who goes out and does his exercise shows its strength. The effects of the sun are felt wherever you go. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, you cannot deny the effects of the sun. And if you don't believe in the effects of the sun, then I suggest you go out on a January day, on a holiday in our January the 26th, on Australia Day, don't put any sun cream on and go and lie in the sun. And you tell me whether or not the sun has effect. The um, and, and, and so the uh, psalmist is trying to help us to see that all of this is showing us something of God's glory. It's a poem I came across that I thought was quite good. He was just a little lad, and on the week's first day, he was wandering home from Sunday school and dawdling on the way. Don't you love poetry that rhymes? I hate the poetry that doesn't rhyme because I don't understand half of it. He scuffed his shoes into the grass. He found a caterpillar. He found a fluffy milkweed pod, and he blew out all the filler. A bird's nest in a tree overhead, so wisely placed on high, was just another wonder that caught his eager eye. And a neighbor watched his zigzag course and hailed him from the lawn, asked him where he'd been that day and what was going on. I've been to Bible school, he said, and turned a piece of sod. He picked up a wiggly worm and said, I've learnt a lot about God. Hmm, a very fine way, the neighbor said, for a boy to spend his time. If you tell me where God is, I'll give you a brand new dime. Quick as a flash, his answer came, nor were his accents faint. I'll give you a dollar, mister, if you'll tell me where God ain't. God is everywhere. God has revealed himself. God has shown himself. He has shown his glory. And so there is a sense in which as you encounter the unbeliever, you almost need to take them to what is obvious in front of them and say to them, if you can't see the creator's hand in this, it's because you have purposely blinded yourself. You have purposely denied what is obvious to the eye. Well, God's glory is seen in the heavens. Secondly, the revelation of God in the Scriptures. Look at verses 7 to 11. The revelation of God in the Scriptures. The law of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of Yahweh are trustworthy, making wise and simple. We're going to pause with these as we go through them. So the revelation of God's law is clearer than nature, because what God's law does is it begins to describe who this creator is. And it gives us information on the character of the creator and what the creator has done and how the creator has revealed himself. 
So if you want to know more about who this creator is in the universe, the way in which we find out about him is by going into his word. There's a list of six benefits. We're going to go through these quite quickly. Number one, God's word gives restoration or revival. It gives healing to the whole person. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The healing that is spoken about in the depths of the being is the healing that God does when he brings a person to himself and he takes a broken sinner who is bound and shackled by sin and he breaks the shackles, he kills the old person and he creates in it a new person and the soul is revived. For the soul without God is dead and without life. And so it is ultimately a speak, a speaking about the deliverance from the guilt and the power of sin that the soul finds in salvation when they come to Christ. And Christ cleanses them and purges them and heals them and takes an unwhole person and finally makes them whole. I don't know if you've, I'm sure you have, but just in case you haven't, when you come to Christ, when God creates in you a new person, for the first time in your life, you become truly human. Because to be truly human is to be in a relationship with Almighty God. Second, God's word gives discretion or wisdom, discretion, to all who are ready to receive it. The simple here doesn't refer to the simple, in other words, those who have got a low IQ. But rather the simple that is referred to is recognizing that every human being has only a tiny fraction of wisdom. And if they are ever going to experience greater wisdom, they will experience it in relationship to God because God is the font of all wisdom and all wisdom derives itself from him. And whatever wisdom you and I possess is a tiny subset of the wisdom of God. So if you would become wise, and there's a whole book on becoming wise, Proverbs in the Bible, you will get to know more and more about God. You will discern more and more of his mind. You will come to know more and more intimately. And as you grow in deeper intimacy with God, so your wisdom will increase. The only truly wise people are those in a relationship with God. And remember, as Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says God's wisdom confounds man's wisdom. And what is wise to God seems foolish to man. And what is foolish to man is wise to God. And God's wisdom operates at a completely different level to what the wisdom of man operates. And whatever discoveries we make, and whatever technological advancements we make, it is only because God in his grace and mercy chooses to reveal to us certain things that are true about the universe. I'll never forget our principal of the college when I was at college. He used to be a chemical engineer by profession before he uh, became a pastor. And he said, I used to sit in the lab or stand in the lab and I was working on something and trying to discover something and we would do tests and experiment of experiments as we were seeking to explore certain things. And eventually he said in exasperation, I would throw up my hands and cry out and say, Lord, why are you holding out on me? Give me wisdom. Help me to see what it is I'm trying to discover because without God's revelation, we discover nothing. And whatever wisdom we possess... All comes from God. So if you want to be wise, you will be a continual learner of who Jesus and God is. You will continue to grow in your relationship with Christ. You will never tire to pursue knowledge of God. It will become the overriding passion of your soul. And as you draw into deeper intimacy with God, so you will become wiser and wiser and wiser. Thirdly, God's word gives delight or joy. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustly, making wise and simple, being there. The precepts of Yahweh are right, giving joy to the heart. Why is it that the precepts give joy to the heart? Because it is in the understanding the precepts of God, understanding the word of God, that you and I discover fullness of life. And it is joy that we discover in Christ who has come that you and I might have life to the full and experience life the way that God intended us to experience that. And so our joy is made complete in a relationship with Jesus. It's amazing how we as humanity strive to be happy, don't we? There are all kinds of things that promise happiness that never deliver ultimate, long-lasting, deep, satisfying inner contentment, no matter what the circumstances, because only Jesus Christ can provide that. And we discover that through the Word, through His precepts. Joy also refers to the life that is lived uprightly before God, the life that lives in conformity with the precepts of God, the person who has learned that God has given us his word, not in order to curb life, not in order to make life difficult for us, not in order to rob us of certain pleasures that seemingly the, the non-Christian can enjoy, but God's word is there to guide, to teach, to help us to get the most out of life. And when we follow it religiously, we discover joy, Peace, tranquility, and contentment in Christ. Fourthly, God's word gives direction, light. The commands of Yahweh are radiant, giving light to the eyes. His word enables us to understand how life is meant to be lived before God. It gives us instructions on what is right and what is wrong. It gives us wisdom on on how we are meant to experience the fullness of life in Christ. It gives light to the eyes. It gives direction to us. It helps us to live fulfilling lives. I need to keep moving. God's Word also teaches us how to fear Him. The fear, verse 9, the fear of Yahweh is pure, enduring. Listen to the words, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Now this is not, and I've said this many times from the pulpit, but let me say it again. This is not a destructive kind of fear that you and I might get when we are put into a dangerous situation. It's not the fear you might have when you're driving along in a car and suddenly you've got a brake because a car's run a red light and you're in danger of hitting that car and you get suddenly anxious and you hit brakes for all you're worth. It's not that kind of fear, but it's a reverential fear that understands who it is in relationship to who God is. Here is this great God who has created the universe and in comparison to God who speaks and matter comes into being, who am I in comparison? comparison to him and the God who holds me in the palm of his hand the God who determines my beginning from the end the God who has structured every single day for me and the God who has determined where I would be born when I would be born to whom I'd be born and the God who's determined how I will die one day and where I will die and what that will look like that God who controls not only my life in that sense, but controls every life in that sense, and is sovereign over it all, and faithfully working out his purposes, such a God needs to be revered. How can you not revere such a God like that? This is not just some ordinary, dead, inanimate idol that has eyes but cannot see, has mouth but cannot speak, has a nose but cannot smell, has ears but cannot hear, has legs but cannot walk. This is the living God who is actively engaged in his creation and who has said that he is coming again. And when he comes again, will destroy this world. This whole universe will be destroyed by fire and God will recreate a new universe. What kind of power is that? And the God 
to whom one day you and I will stand and give an account. Who will scrutinize us. Who will stand before the throne of judgment on that day of Yahweh. And there God will begin to question and we shall answer. And the only thing that you and I can hang on to when we stand before God is the fact that we have trusted in Jesus Christ. For he is our righteousness. He is our vindication. He is the one who will stand up and say, he belongs to me, she belongs to me. Fear God. Do you fear God like that? Is your life lived out in the fear of God? Do you have a certain reverence to him so that you don't treat him too familiarly? Familiarity breeds contempt. And we need to be careful that we don't just treat God as though he's just some ordinary person. He's not. Number six, God's word is trustworthy and righteous. Trustworthy and righteous. The ordinances, verse 9b, the ordinance of the law are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, much more than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than the honey from the comb. Jesus paused there. God's word is trustworthy and righteous. In other words, this is the psalmist's way of saying that God's word from start to finish is flawless. It's not as if somehow there is some part of God's word that as human beings we sit down with a little microscope and scrutinize and say, I'm not sure that God got it right there. I'm not sure that God actually said what he needed to have said. Maybe that particular part of the word of God is incorrectly translated or incorrectly given by God. No, no, from Genesis through to Revelation, from start to finish, every part of God's word is true. It's trustworthy. When God says do not, there's good reason why he says do not. When God says do, there's good reason why he says do. When God tells us how we ought to live in terms of our sexual ethics, it's not God trying to deprive us. It's God trying to ensure that as our sexuality is expressed, for example, that we gain maximum out of that expression of our sexuality. And to go against God's word or to question him at that point is to take a knife and dig it into yourself. No, it's trustworthy. And so as Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16, you know the verses, all scriptures God breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in all righteousness so that the person of God may be built up. It is a God-breathed word. In other words, It is the Holy Spirit coming upon the authors of Scripture, upon the prophets and the apostles, so that as the Holy Spirit so comes upon them and they begin to pen the Word of God, they don't just write their own thoughts. They don't just write what they want to write. They are led by God, the Holy Spirit, to write what God wants recorded. So that Scripture is inspired of God. That Scripture is inerrant without error. That scripture is sufficient for life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. And therefore, scripture has all authority. And so we bring ourselves in submission to the authority of God's word, under the umbrella of God's word, and we live according to God's word. And we trust that his word knows best. It transforms us. It changes us. It molds us more and more into the image of Christ. It purifies us. It divides bone from marrow. It penetrates into the very depths of our being. And the Holy Spirit takes the word like a refiner and he refines us in the furnace. Notice what else he says. There's great reward from keeping God's word. By them your servant is warned, verse 11. In keeping them there is great reward. So there is warning and there is reward. There are warnings to tell us how we ought not to live. And because if we live in those ways, it's going to create damage and cause damage to us. And then there's great reward in uh, uh, God's word for it brings a sense of fulfillment and contentment in life.
And there's great reward because at the end of the day, when we submit to the word of God and we allow the word of God to be our guide for life, one day we will be rewarded in the eternal life in heaven. So let me ask you, is God's word integrated into your living? Does God's word determine how you live? Are you bringing yourself under its submission? Are you and God arguing about something in his word? Do you really believe it? Or do you think that some of the commands and some of the warnings and some of the prohibitions are somehow depriving you of some enjoyment of life? Or are you fully convinced in your own mind and heart that everything God has revealed in his word is profitable for you, is beneficial for you? Is God's word something you love and desire? If it is, it will be integrated consistently into your living. It's not enough just to say, I know. And then thirdly, very quickly, the revelation of God in the soul. The revelation of God in the soul. Look at verses 12 to 14. Who can discern his errors? I love these verses. Forgive my hidden faults. Do you, do you know what the psalmist is doing there? He's saying, I recognize that I have blind spots. I recognize that I live in a certain way, and sometimes I'm sinning in ways that I'm not even cognizant of. I'm not even aware of. I'm not even, you know, I don't even know I'm doing these sins. I, I, I'm just living life, and, and there are some hidden sins in my soul because I, all of us have those blind spots, and, and I want you to reveal those to me. I want you to forgive me. Help me to discern those errors. Do you know, it's like when I, I type out something, if I'm typing out a, a letter or if I'm typing out an essay or a, a something that I'm going to write somewhere in fullness, because I only do outlines for sermons, I will always go to Janice and I'll say to read it. So when I'm doing my church report, for example, I'll get Janice to read it first and I'll say, pick up all the mistakes. And she'll come back and there are little marks everywhere and I kind of get quite disillusioned. I think, gee, what's the point, you know? Um, you could have been a bit more gentle, just ignored some. But they're, they're, they're mistakes. Now, you know, you know the irony? is sometimes I can read it, reread it, and reread it and miss my own mistakes. I mean, that's why you have editors, don't you? Because the editor picks up those things, and we all do that. Well, in the same way, we sin in ways that we may not be fully aware of. And this psalmist is so committed to Christ, so committed to God, that he says, help me to discern those hidden sins. And if I don't discern, then forgive me anyway. Do you sometimes come before God in your time of confession and say, Lord, you know, there are probably things I've done that I ought not to have done that I'm not aware of. Lord, please forgive me. Do you remember how Job prayed for his children? Do you remember in the book of Job as it opens up and, and Job's children are, are feasting and having a good time and then the whole house caves in and they all die? Job, prior to that, says he prays for his children just in case they're sinning. They may be unaware of it, but their father's praying for them. Well, the psalmist is doing that. And we should do the same. Then what? notice what he says. Verse 13. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me, that I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Now he switches tack. And he recognizes there are some sins he commits that are deliberate sins. There are some times when you and I, when we are tempted by the devil, or tempted by the demons tempted by our own desires that well up within us, that when we are about to sin, what we know we are going to do is sinful, and yet somehow we feel almost unable to resist the temptation, and we find ourselves sinning. Haven't you experienced that in your life, those willful sins? And you think, how did I do that? I knew it was wrong. I knew I shouldn't have done it, and yet I did it anyway. Well, it's those willful sins that he prays and says, Lord, forgive me of those willful sins. Prevent me 
from always succumbing to them. Now, the author to the Hebrews in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, talks about the sin that so easily entangles. And, and that sin that he's talking about there is that one sin or two or three or four, whatever it might be in your case, that repetitive sin. That sin, you find yourself repeatedly coming before God and saying, Lord, I've done it again. We've all got them. So don't look to the person next to you and start thinking, I wonder what willful sins they've got. And it's those sins that he says, Lord, prevent me, prevent me, stop me from committing those. Do we pray like that? Do you spend some time in your prayer time and say, Lord, I know there's some deliberate sins that I just somehow seem as though it's impossible for me to resist now, oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit whom you've given to me, who resides in me, oh God, enable me not to sin like that again. And when that temptation comes as strong and as fierce as it is, and as much as I feel weak, oh God, empower me to resist. What does the scripture say? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What else does it say? No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can come out of it, so that you can resist it, so that you can push it away. In other words, you are not tempted. There is no unique temptation in this world, not one. You, when you go through those willful sins, those repetitive sins, you are not alone. You're not the first person to uh, struggle with that. And as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says that you might bear up under it. In other words, when you are tempted and you want to sin and you feel compelled to sin, God has given you a means by which you don't have to yield. The question is, do we pray like that? What are your deliberate sins? What are your willful sins? And then he says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. In other words, Lord, I want to live a life that reflects who you are. I want my life to revolve around you. I want you to be the center point of my life. I want to speak and act and behave in a way that is pleasing on you. So help me to meditate upon you. And the meditation here is not a kind of a, a divorcing of oneself or an emptying of the mind. That is transcendental meditation. That's part of the, the religions out there. But rather the meditation is meditating upon the precepts of God, upon the commands of God. Read Psalm 119. Let me allow those to infiltrate into the depths of my soul so that my behavior and actions are driven by your word. so that I might be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, my steadfast companion, the one who redeems me from trouble and sin, the one who remains steadfast throughout, the one who doesn't change, the one who by his very nature is a redeemer, who is able to rescue me, and deliver me, O oh God. May all my life be a pleasing in your sight. Is that your desire? If you were to be assessed by your non-Christian friends, would their evaluation be of you? He or she has got something about them that sets them out and apart from everyone else. Because Christ is oozing out of every pore of your being. Would they say that? Would they say that of me? When you think about how you speak, is your speech 
one that is full of grace and mercy? Do you only say that which is helpful for the building up of others? Do not let any unwholesome speech come out of your mouth, writes Paul. But only, only that which is helpful for building others up, that the person of God may be strengthened. Is your life so bound to Christ that wherever you go, you leave behind the fragrance of Jesus? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this incredible psalm that was written thousands of years ago that still speaks so powerfully to us today. May your word so take hold of our lives that we might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ more and more each new day so that his life will be in us and lived out through us that we might be more and more and more conformed to the beautiful image of Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand as